Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Troll, we're going to learn something today, man. Good to see you. It's been too long. We've had quite a hiatus, you know. We we, uh, we worked so hard and we've been kind of crazy lately trying to save the world. And uh, now we got a great guest to get us back together. Yeah, we, we you know, we, we get to, inter- you know, we have a lucky job. We get to interview, you know, successful people, people who have, you know, claimed, you know, their own little corner of, of uh, metabolic health you know, from luminaries to entrepreneurs. And we get a little bit of both today. You know, uh, if you don't know who Darth Luigi is, or if you uh, don't know who Luis Villasenor is, um, you know, he's been in the ketogenic space uh, for quite some time. Uh, He's the CEO of Keto Gains. uh, And I think he's also uh, related to LMNT, the the drink, uh, and some other things. Um, He has been open about his own sort of bodybuilding career and his own struggles with uh, an eating disorder, which I think would make for great discussion. Um, and, you know, keto gains is a very sort of specific approach to implementing a ketogenic diet, uh, typically in conjunction with exercise. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'd love to hear more about it. So I'm excited about this, Brian, I don't, you know, you know, I know there's always a little controversy, like he well, said. Say, said the, you know. the, only, the only thing, Charles, is like, if this was our job, we'd be <laughs> in trouble. We don't have any income from this, right? So, but it's awesome. It's awesome. I mean, the, the payment we get is we learn from everyone. It's like a, you know, this morning I was thinking it's like a puzzle and we all have our little part of the puzzle. Tro and I are only smart enough to put out the outside stuff and we have all you smart guys come and fill in all the hard middle part of that puzzle, right? So it's cool to see applications too, and not just theory. Like here, you're working with real people. It's not like you you work out a mathematical equation somewhere. You go, here's what's working, guys. And I think if we have that mindset, we go, okay, what's working for you? What can we adopt from you? And we all become better from that. So welcome. It's great to have you. Tell people your story. Thank you, Brian. So uh, to make the, the long story short, uh, and we'll talk into the eating disorders and everything else later. Um Basically, my initial story, I was the, the fat kid at school, right? The one that got bullied and picked up on, wasn't really good at sports. I actually don't like sports nor follow sports, maybe except for bodybuilding, powerlifting, maybe a little bit of crossfit in between. That's more of a recent discovery. So I found myself that I didn't want to be fat anymore. We're talking about in the 80s. I'm uh, 46. So my first contact with fitness was that I wanted to, and I love to play video games. And I decided to find a way to make it easier for me to exercise and play video games at the same time. So I discovered that I could walk on a treadmill while I'll play video games, right? Mostly RPG. So if I was going to be three or four hours playing, I don't know, Final Fantasy or whatever, I could do it while I was probably exercising. And that's what got me into probably losing my two or three or four pounds, right? And with things like that, I sort of gravitated toward finding ways to trick myself into maybe being a little bit more active without actually changing my diet. And then eventually, uh, I recall my mother once took me to a dietitian and she gave me the classic white paper with, uh, this is what you have for breakfast, this is what you have for lunch, this is what you have for, for dinner, and so on and so forth. And it didn't really work for me, especially because uh, this dietitian was overweight. Right. And my first impression is, how are you going to actually teach me how to lose fat when you are this big? And it didn't ring a bell for me. And I'm a very curious person in the sense that I like to understand how things work. And I'm very a rebel in a way that if it doesn't resonate with me or it doesn't make sense, I'm going to try to find why and make it happen my way. And that's one of the reasons why I started studying about nutrition and training and bodybuilding because I wasn't good at sports, but I found out I was stronger than my peers or that it could be something that in a way challenged me. I didn't have to run because I hate running, but I could do more push-ups or more uh, pull-ups than my peers. And so I started to try to do those things and the work slowly gravitated toward, you know, strength training, bodybuilding, and especially at that time and age, 
where we had Arnold and uh, Rambo and as you know, spokes models, He-Man was all the rage. I'm a He-Man kid, basically. Then what happened is uh, I sort of got a little bit leaner. I wasn't overweight but back then. It was more like in the chubby side. I got into college. And during that time, basically, I don't know exactly why or when it happened, but in between the pressure from studying, maybe some girls in between, uh, I remember that I found myself eating about 400 calories a day and doing lots of uh, cardio in the sense of uh, bicycling. And uh, I was just super thin. And it, for me, it was normal. And I still have pictures of that time. And I tend to look a little bit like Michael Jackson. I was pasty white. I had long hair at the moment. Uh, I used to wear glasses. And the moment that I realized that I had an eating disorder and that it hit me was once I was trying a pair of jeans and they were up to my ankles. And I was like, uh, how did these jeans shrunk? And they were my little brother, which was eight years at the moment. Those were wow. his jeans. And I looked at myself in the mirror, was pursuing having abs, for example. But I, all I could see was a tummy because I was skinny fat, my ribs like a golem. And of course, my hair had started to fall off, right? And uh, I knew about counting calories. I knew about how to lose weight by counting calories and eating less. But I was just, I had fallen into that trap of just eat a salad with a little bit of chicken. I wasn't really that hungry because I was very busy, but I was seriously malnourished and, oh, well, anorexic to a point. And of course, that eventually. I sort of uh, started eating healthier, but I gravitated towards the other side, which is uh, binge eating disorders, right? So what happened is, okay, I sort of controlled myself, but then over the weekend when you had pizza or you had candy or cake or whatever, I ate everything I could. And then that gravitated toward guilt and I purged. So basically in that space where you are anorexic most of the time, but when you are in contact with certain foods that have triggering issues, mostly high carb foods, mostly cakes, mostly those things that I had an emotional connection with me. I used to eat a lot hidden and then I purged, right? And um, this is sort of like when I first had contact with a ketogenic diet, which happened that I studied and I majored in business administration and then eventually also uh, majored in marketing. But as I always dabbled in nutrition and bodybuilding just for, because I liked it. And let's go back in time to understand that we're talking about 1990. So there wasn't really actually a big internet presence per se. I had my original Hotmail account, which only needed a password with four letters, right? And I used to go into the library and read books about nutrition and then gravitated toward bulletin boards at the moment, you know, bodybuilding.com and things like that. We're talking about 20 years ago. And I got in contact back then with Lyle McDonald and Dan Duquesne. I don't know how I got in contact with them. If you don't know who those guys are, those are basically the pillars of low carb dieting for muscle building. And a lot of people don't know, but actually a lot of the protocols for muscle building for bodybuilder pros are centered or have a place uh, with a ketogenic diet for certain parts of the competition, right? For uh, prep, for example. So how do you get super lean while maintaining lots of muscle, etc.? It's a classic uh, anabolic diet but by Dan Duquesne or the Palumbo diet, which is basically very much like the carnivore diet that is popular nowadays. So I started to see, okay, maybe that this approach works with me. Let's try it out. And it worked perfectly in me in, in two areas. First, it resonated a lot with what I had learned about nutrition and the importance of protein, et cetera. But it, I also found out that it basically uh, silenced any craving that I had. I wasn't hungry. I was energetic. It worked well for me, both in the mental state of feeling calm and uh, not anxious about food. I majored very well in, in, in my studies. I didn't have an issue with studying or anything else. I was also outright. I felt right with my peers. Like all the, the issues that I had regarding anxiety, et cetera, disappeared when I started eating like this. I didn't really 
put two and two together back then that it was just because of the diet. Probably I thought it was just eating better, more a little bit more vegetables, more meat, more protein, more food overall versus what I was eating. But in the end also helped me one of the fears that I think a lot of people that have been overweight for a while have is I don't want to gain weight back because I don't want to go back into that place where I was bullied at school, right? And it eventually helped me change my identity into from being the fat kid at school to being now uh, what people usually ask me for or started asking me for fitness advice, something that was totally contrary to the identity I had had when I was uh, growing up, right? And that is basically what led me to, in a way, create the Keto Gains Protocol, which was born out of a marriage between traditional ketogenic diets, which I also started studying on the side, versus how to apply them using what I had learned both from um, Dane Duquesne, uh, Palumbo, uh, Lyle McDonald on their writings, books, their discoveries with myself and my self journey, right? Eventually, I decided to change careers. Uh, I found the Keto Gains as an actual coaching company. And we've applied what we've learned both from myself and from our thousands of clients into a protocol, not just for training and bodybuilding. Basically, a lot of people may think that Keto Gains is just for training and people that want to be bodybuilders. On the contrary, I'd say that 80% of our clients are females over 40 and in between 65. And basically, I'll come from a um, story of trying different diets and they just want to get healthier and look better and be more comfortable in their physique. And we do use strength training as one of our pillars because as you guys probably know, muscle is not just for looks, right? It has many purposes. Of course, you look better when you have more muscle tissue, but it's a metabolic furnace. And because a lot of our clients come from uh, a history of uh, either uh, metabolic issues diabetes, for example, in most cases, or insulin resistance, the more muscle you have to a point, the more metabolically flexible you are going to become, right? The more leeway for carbohydrates that you, you are going to, to be able to, to eat. Um, of course, again, many of the benefits of looking better, being stronger, that, and uh, building resilience that comes with all of that type of training. But overall, you're going to be much more healthily overall if you put more muscle, especially uh, going with the fact that after 30, 40 years, we start to just lose muscle naturally, right? That's one of the reasons why we see uh, us uh, having a lower metabolic rate or being it more difficult to maintain our physique as we age, even if we are supposedly eating the same amount of calories or whatever, right? So that's basically it. <laughs> Way too reasonable and scientific, right? Way, way too reasonable. And that's, you know, Tro, I think, you know, for me, Ben Vicicchio, okay, Ben, if you're listening ever, you know, you're right. He goes, look, the, the biggest the biggest indicator for longevity is muscle mass. You look at the data, that's what it shows. You smoke, drink, you have muscle mass, you live longer. That's the bottom line. So that was my concern in looking back, like at, you know, look at yourself now versus when you were way skinnier than you are now, right? And you go, okay, was I healthier then or now? Clearly now. So a lot of people, and and I think, and I, I don't want to get too off into the weeds, but you know, we're we're looking at drugs now where you lose weight, but you know, fifty to seventy percent of that weight loss is muscle mass. That is a losing proposition. I can one hundred percent guarantee you, knowing what we know, right? So what you're saying is, you put on the muscle mass, then you could get away with more carbs, and I see it all the time in my patients. Once they get metabolically healthier, they can get away with more. It's not like you. And when people say it's too restrictive, you go, yeah, at the beginning you have to at some degree if you're metabolically really sick. But then you have more metabolic flexibility as you go down the road. Tro? Totally. And, and, and just to point something out, a lot of people uh, may think that keto is, like you were saying, is too restrictive or that you do certain things. But just to put it in perspective, depending on the type of client that we have and what the client actually wants to do, we have clients that either count calories or not. And then we also have clients that eventually they go out of a low-carb state either because they want to experiment with something else or because they are either their job or their, uh, their sport of choice or just a decision warrants it, right? I have clients that start with- Holidays, weddings, ago. whatever, right? Yeah, and, and it's about teaching them because it's not just a carb, it's a carb, it's a carb. Yeah, in, in paper they are, but it's totally different to get maybe 50 or 100 grams of carbs from sweet potato 
versus getting that from dextrose or from a, from a cake or et cetera. It's going to work and do different things in your body. And there's some place where maybe that carrot cake can even help you maybe lift uh, 20 pounds more. And there's another where that carrot cake would put you in a carb coma and it's not going to be funny, right? It really depends. And, and just to recapitulate that, I have a few clients that started with 20 grams of carbs and now they're in 200 and 250 and they are leaner than they were three years ago. But because it was a process that for that particular person, that change worked very well. I have a countless others that no, carbs don't work for them, right? It's, it's a very personal uh, thing that goes with a few caveats that one has to review. But I don't think that per se, a low carb or a keto diet is the best diet for anyone. But sadly, in this day and age, I do think that everybody will be uh, work much better with the, uh, with lowering the amount of carbs that they are currently having because nowadays it's like a stigma to eat healthier and to think about eating less carbs and eating more meat or eating more eggs or etc right everything that it's it's sort of funny but you have to go very much against the dietary guidelines to be actually healthy if you want to have success today right so, so I'm uh, I have not heard one thing I've disagreed with. So uh, I, I want to I want to actually go back into your own personal journey. You know, you mentioned uh, playing a lot of video games. You mentioned you had very little appetite. Uh, you mentioned like uh, you know a, a bit of anxiety even at some point. You know, to what degree do you feel like you know this this anxiety? Right. Do you think your anxiety led you to play video games? Your anxiety led you to the gym? Your anxiety led you to restrict your eating? Or maybe the anxiety itself was the anorexia. And then at some point when you realize that anxiety, you're like, oh, crap, I have to eat. And you're trying to normalize this eating. And it and it becomes like this, uh, you know, you, you're trying to normalize eating behavior with addictive food. You mentioned the cakes, the cookies. And that results in the opposite end of the spectrum. Agnes Satan, who's written on this, you know, um, this sort of flip-flopping of the, the uh, eating disorder spectrum. Um, but if you, if you look at the sort of the underlying, you know, thing here, do you think anxiety was a big factor that played in your, in, in sort of your life? If you ask me today, if I consider myself an, anx an anxious person, I would say no. I know that it's maybe because of how I behave and I'm in control of my life in the last probably 20 years, right? Because it's been, a, I'm a totally different person than I was probably back then. But if I probably were to be in my shoes again when I was a kid, uh, the thing is I was someone very, or still very self-aware. I tend to worry about what people think of me or my physique or et cetera. Probably, again, when I was an, an overweight kid. And I was also very lonely in the sense that I preferred, you know, play video games, read a lot versus hang out with, with other kids, et cetera. Likely, there's a sort of uh, anxiety in, in a way because I was, again, the nerd or the, the guy that was picked upon. What I do see, and, and I don't know if it's actually anxiety, but what I felt, and I think it resonates with a lot of people that are, in a way, saying that they are addicted to carbs or sugar, is when I'm eating like I need to be eating or like I I'm eat nowadays, which is basically like a whole food keto diet, more leaning toward a carnivore diet, I'm totally in control of when I eat and what I eat. I eat have breakfast and I'm completely satisfied and full. Like there's a feeling that I'm actually totally satisfied. Or it has, I recall when I was exposed, for example, in, in, in my binge episodes, I could eat myself two or three cakes, whole cakes. And I'm eating whole family size cakes and I would not feel full even if I had the, the food up to here. And my latest episode ever, was actually when I was an adult in a wedding. I didn't call it a pinch. I call it a carb load. But I had, imagine that you're in a wedding where those they, they have those um, uh, uh, dessert tables, right? And they have cakes and ice cream and cookies and whatever. 
I ate by myself about three whole uh, corn cakes. And I had the waiters, uh, they had the instruction to put another cake if one was finished. So I ate by myself three cakes. And in between, while they were bringing the new cakes, there was also uh, Mrs. Fields cookies and they had like uh, eggnog and stuff. And I was dipping cookies, you know, like that. And they were betting that I couldn't finish another cake. So I ate probably in the, in the span of two or three hours, more than 8,000 or 9,000 calories just from all those desserts. Yeah, and this I is fascinating, man. On. It's fascinating because you were a guy eating 400 calories during the week, like you're doing your thing. So what do you think, what do you attribute those binges to? Is it, Do you think it's like once you taste the sugar and your brain got that dopamine hit that you just wanted more and more? Because I hear patients saying that with binge eating disorder, and I don't know if you've seen it, Tro, but I go, look, if I give you a drug to make you feel full faster, I do something and they're like, it doesn't matter. I could eat a whole meal and I'll go out and I'll, and I go, how about if you don't have it in your house, I'll drive to like, I'll drive to McDonald's in the middle of the night or wherever, like 24 hour food. And they don't care. Even if it's inconvenient, they'll go. It's like, you're a drug addict. I've had patients exactly in that scenario where thankfully I never been in that case where, I where, okay, I'll eat whatever I have at home. But once it's finished, it's like my, for me, it's a stop. But I, if, you, if there are three cakes, I will eat three cakes. But I've had patients that basically, like you said, it's snowing and there's a snowstorm in the middle of the night and they have to drive probably two hours to get to the nearest uh, 7-Eleven and they will drive mm -hmm. there and buy countless of food and then go back and eat it at home silently, right? And that's yeah, what do, what do you think the mechanism of that is? Because, you know, a guy, like it, you clearly show when you're underweight, right? You're underweight. You've lost weight. Weight's no longer the issue. And you're eating five, you're just naturally eating 500 calories a day and you're riding your bike and you're doing all activity. And then on the weekends you go crazy. What do you like? Well, it's not that you're not a disciplined person, obviously, because not all week you're binging. So I have some people hormonally, women in particular, like certain times of their period, they go crazy. And then like for three weeks, they're perfect. And then for one week, they're crazy eating everything. And it's like, it's so frustrating because you can't dig out from under that. I know there, and I'm not, not an expert in this area. I'm not a psychiatrist nor something, but from what I've read, there are hormonal mechanisms here mm -hmm. that are also intertwined with uh, pleasure, you know, like dopamine and all those signals, and also habits. So the moment that you are exposed to certain uh, flavors, tastes, and smells, if you are not in a good zone mentally, stress wise, you are more prone to succumb. And this is this has uh, been studied. There, there are a few studies that um, have reviewed how we respond to certain stress signals. I don't know if you've seen the study on the on the prisoners where they were asking for uh, to to be to have their sentence reviewed and and reduced, and the judges that were fed or not fed. Have you seen that study? No, no. no tell us a, about. There's a study to that was used to review willpower and how uh, being fed or uh, satisfied with certain mechanisms actually affected decision-making. So what they had is they had uh, their prisoners that were going to have their sentences reviewed by jurors. And what they found was that the prisoners that had the sentences reviewed earlier in the morning after the jurors had been, uh, you know, had breakfast, had a linear or how do you say, a lenient sentence or a more favorable review uh, uh, versus those that had their sentences reviewed later during the day as they, the hours passed along. And then after they had a break and had lunch, again, the, the sentences were reviewed more favorably. And so what the study concluded is when you're overly stressed, not fed, et cetera, you just want to get it over with and are going to make more decisions based on a whim mm -hmm. versus actually studying and reviewing whatever right and this is this goes very well also with the classic view that we've seen any i think all of us have been participate uh, have participated or have had this issue where you go to a supermarket and you go well fed mm -hmm. you're just, just gonna go and grab whatever you need on the contrary if you are hungry famished or whatever you're gonna go and grab all the desserts or whatever you see and you're gonna be more prone to making bad decisions right mm -hmm. So I yeah, think and this is sort of what affects if you are, and I see this also with a lot of clients and I'm sure you guys see the same. If you have a very anxious client that's overly stressed, that has, that is going through very bad, uh, a very bad place in their life, putting them on an actual restrictive diet at the moment, is going to be a, a horrible decision because 
they are also going to have to restrict and count and many things that are just going to be the another thing that's another thing that adds more stress in their in their life. Yeah, absolutely. I love it, man. I love this is exactly what I'm seeing clinically. Tro, you go for it, man. Yeah. So, so th this is actually a really good segue. So we're talking about the behavioral approaches, the behavioral and hormonal approaches and mental health models for, uh, for obesity, right? Uh, I, we're all believers, um, that carbohydrate restriction has, uh, unique properties, right? On glycemia and the ketones effects on the brain. So we, so not that we perfectly ascribe to the carbohydrate insulin model, but we're all favorable here on the idea that uh, carbohydrate restriction is unique, right? I think um, one of the most interesting models for obesity is understanding, you know, the impact of stress and mental health. And one of the biggest problems I've had in the thermodynamic model to approach obesity is that it almost completely, you know, neglects the root cause of what it is we're exactly talking about here, which is that stress is one of the most important triggers. Sleeplessness is one of the most important triggers and mental health is one of the most important triggers to obesity. And when we take a group of doctors, dietitians, trainers, you know, a healthcare system, and we make them think, hey, this is energy in and energy out, and this is the basis for obesity, instead of saying, well, wait a second, this actually has to do with, you know, the impact of the food you're eating on your brain. It has to do with blood sugar fluctuations. It has to do with sleep and it has to do with stress and mental health, you know, uh, and sleeplessness. Sleeplessness will drive people on average to eat 300 calories more. Stress will drive people to eat as if they're hungry without the self-perception of hunger. So if we... You and know, those, my, and both of those things will make you drink more, which lowers your inhibitions to, you know, go binge eat again, more. right? So, so now if you take the sort of behavioral mental health and, and sort of uh, carbohydrate insulin model and you mash them together, you have a, in my opinion, a very ideal model, right? And so, so one of the criticisms I faced because I think that focusing on calories is nearly useless, like I just think it's a, not a, a useful metric, is that people think this means that we should disregard energy. And they point to bodybuilders and they say, look at how they do it. They so accurately track you know, what they eat. And, you know, my response to that, and I'd love to hear your opinion is, well, they could just track anything else. They could track the size of the food they're eating and slowly decrease that. They could track the length of the time they're eating in a day and slowly track that. They could track any metric, right? That is not, you know, calories um, and probably achieve very similar results. So you've worked, you're, you're in that community more than I am. You know, you've had great success as a bodybuilder. You've probably worked with those types. And I know you have a vast type of sort of consults that you get, but you probably have more experience than I do in that particular population, right? So help me, am I saying something that you think is grossly inaccurate? Did I say something that, you know, would would harm the population that you may see that I may not. And I, you know, not to say that's all you see, but this particular population, I mean, you're that population. Yeah. So if I told you, Luis, like drop the calories, you know, you know, the quality of the food you're eating, you know, what type of food it is. If you're not happy with your fat goals, you could just decrease the quantity of it, you know, eyeballing, you know, yeah. you're eating a pound of steak. Well now do, you know, three fourths of a pound of steak, you know? So am I, Am I so far out? Is this like insanity to you? You know, no, help me no, understand. So, so here, here, just uh, one thing that that is important to understand: bodybuilders, actual bodybuilders, are a very small subset part of the population, and uh, they, I do believe that people that actually have a, a successful career have a few differences, both genetically, of course, like. They are, of course, in most cases, going to be using anabolic steroids and are the super big responders to those drugs. But also in their mindset and their will, their willpower, there are different beasts, which not many people partake. And I'm going to explain why briefly, because I just had another podcast in the morning in Spanish where I explained this concept. Uh, some people don't know or don't or not aware or there are like two camps regarding willpower, right? that you can either uh, train it like a muscle or that it's just uh, finite and there's nothing you can do about it. 
And actually, Chris Williamson uh, had a recent podcast with Dr. Huberman where they discussed this concept. I don't know mm -hmm. if you saw, saw it, but it's about uh, th there's a part in our brain that actually seems to be uh, what regulates willpower. And what they explain is that on people that are high achievers, this part is more developed. And this is not just you were born like that. In some cases, of course, yes, but bodybuilders are people that train in a certain way that are known to overcome challenges, tend to have it to have it bigger. And people that are overweight but tend to lose weight increase the size of it. So people that are uh, overweight or that are going through certain challenges haven't really trained it correctly for a while. On the contrary, this is something that uh, uh, claimed my attention. Anorexic persons tend to have it very well developed because you force yourself to not eat. Basically, it's again, you put yourself mm. through challenges, but then over time, it becomes easier. So what they say is, how do you develop this uh, area of your brain? Basically, put yourself into mini tasks that are a little bit challenging, but not impossible, that you don't like, so that you are in a way exercising it as, as if it were a muscle and it will be easier for you eventually to overcome. I do think that bodybuilders have exercised this area in a greater extent than other people and very, very much with athletes or high achievers in various different areas of our uh, either economy, you know, people that are high, uh, you know, entrepreneurs or et cetera, that are more resilient to stress. I do think that there's a component there. On regards of tracking calories, you can actually be a mildly successful or very successful bodybuilder without actually tracking calories per se. If you just are aware of what you're eating and follow certain, you know, rules of thumb. I myself don't track calories, haven't tracked ever since COVID. I've been probably four years since I actually track. I do have chronometer and other apps and then eventually check the macros of something that I don't remember. But I just eat about the same food myself every day. And I can keep a very low body fat, body composition. And the moment that I see I'm probably gaining a little bit more weight than I'd like to be, I just got a little bit few things here or there. And for example, on keto games, we don't actually suggest calories. I suggest macros. What I do, and this is my way of teaching people is, probably you've read this uh, sentence somewhere. I try to teach people, protein is a goal. Why? Because protein is, as we say, the centerpiece for metabolic health. So I want to help people reach a certain amount of protein per day and get them accustomed to eating that because also protein is one of the most satiating macros. So if you hit your protein, and especially from whole foods, not shakes, not bars, it's going to be very difficult for you to be hungry and trying to deviate for something else. Every time that I see that someone is hungry or deviating toward other foods, it's because they're under eating protein or using protein shakes or protein bars or whatever, right? But if you're eating a steak, eggs, uh, whatever, you're going to be satisfied. And the most, it's funny, but usually when I give uh, macros to some clients, the first uh, thing that I get usually for females is, it's way too much food. I cannot be eating this. Like, yeah. hey, you were eating a whole pizza yesterday and now you're complaining that you cannot finish a steak, right? So it's protein is a goal. Carbs, because we are in a context of a low carb diet, are a limit. What is the limit? 30, 20, 50 grams, depending on the context and the metabolic health of the person. But the caveat is that these carbs come from green vegetables that grow above ground, not uh, keto five foods, not uh, keto bread. No, it has to be whole food, especially yeah, high in fiber, high in micronutrients. For me, micronutrients are super important because they are also related to overall satiety and well-being. And then fat is a lever, meaning that you adjust fat depending on your energy levels, your hunger, your current goals. You, you want to lose weight? Okay, let's dial fat down a little bit. Or let's increase it again. Maybe you're today very anxious, very hungry. Let's add a little bit more fat and so on and so forth. And that's very much it. Calories are a subsequent of the macro calculations. But in the end, I don't really care about calories. I care about that you follow these guidelines. Eat always protein on every meal. If you want some carbs, they are great as a garnish. They help with to help you reach micronutrient, uh, the amounts of micronutrients that your body needs. And fat is what is going to give you the overall energy that you need to be energetic, 
have your hormonal functions work completely correctly, et cetera, right? Yeah, and if you and if you can tap into your own body fat, you don't need as much exogenous fat to eat, right? Because you, you have an energy totally. source there. We're e exercising, and I think, Tro, that's that's exactly what we're doing with patients too. So as we're saying, okay, let's go up on the fat and use that as a ledge, a lever at first to get the insulin down, right? So that now we can start like using our own body fat. It's going to be a lot better. And and the other thing, uh, there's so much that you're saying that I love, but I'll have to ask you a question. When you put these people on a high protein diet, how many people have you seen go into kidney failure from eating a high protein diet? None right? whatsoever. If anyone is going to, it's going to be the big muscle builder guys who are taking tons of protein. So people are like, if I eat like turkey, I'm going to go into kidney failure. It's like, where do you get that from? It's ridiculous. Even Jason Funk says it's ridiculous, but this you know, mindset uh, is out there. The, the protein thing, uh, you know, uh, like uh, you guys are clinical doctors. Who are the biggest, well, the, the biggest population that's actually with kidney failure? And using uh, like uh, what what's the name of um, when they change uh sorry uh, dialysis dialysis yeah sorry the, uh, remember that I'm um, Spanish speaking um, the biggest well the biggest population that needs dialysis is diabetics it's not bodybuilders it's not filled out. like if if we actually were just from eating high amount of protein it would be filled with bodybuilders and actually the reason so why a lot of bodybuilders end up with kidney failure is not because of the protein it's because of the drugs they use well let's That's let's crazy. let's let's talk about this because i know you know i have some and carbohydrate thoughts. and carbohydrate cycling like huge I like will. some of these guys do huge carbohydrate cycling so they, they have six-pack abs but visceral fat underneath and their belly's pooching out or they're using growth hormone and steroids and all that so that's you know a totally what? different ball game this is another very interesting topic to consider but when you do a dexa scan for example, with patients that are on low carb, they will you will see that eventually. I don't know if you guys don't do DEXA scans. Most of our patients that they submit their DEXA scans, they have super low levels of visceral fat. Even if they have 20, 30% body fat and they're currently losing, when we compare versus when they had a high carb diet, their visceral fat is super low. We're talking about less than two pounds or one pound, and it's getting lower. On the contrary, I've seen uh, Dexes from high end bodybuilders with 4% body fat, 8% body fat, half of their body fat is in their organs. Like they're, they have paper thin skin, but the amount of fat they have is not where it should be. Yeah, of course, some like uh, in, in their skin and some in your muscles. You, it, For example, in, in the case of low carb athletes, you use more fatty acids rather than ketones as fuel, and you have more intramuscular body fat. It doesn't look like marbly fat like in a cow, but you use more more fat, right? In 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 uh, these bodybuilders, the fat like like you mentioned, they have is intra visceral body fat, which is the unhealthy kind. But th th these are guys who are shooting insulin, right, to really get that muscle building effect. So it's not naturally bodybuilders like a guy like you is not going to have that. No, no, no. For example, I I'm someone that are that I'm very careful, especially because. Two things, because I've been so long on the diet and because I'm someone that I'm in the scope of social social media, right? I don't want to be into, oh, yeah, Luis Villasenor, he died of kidney failure and heart attack because he's been doing 23 years of keto. When I started, I have doctors in my family, right? And they were doing saying the classic things that we've all seen. Oh, you cannot do the diet for more than three months. It's like, why? I don't know, but I've read it that you're going to get a heart attack, okay? It's been three months. Here are my studies. How's my, my cholesterol? How, how's my, how are my numbers? That's, those are one of the things that eventually led me to actually study nutrition. I, I did, I'm a bike, what you will call a, a registered dietitian in Mexico, specialized in, in sports. Uh, I actually studied and went back to college just to be able to demythify and you know be able to say with authority that a lot of the things that we are taught in medical school and dietitian school are not correct in certain contexts, right? Again, the, the issue with, we, we all see with cholesterol. In my case, I'm, I think I'm an outlier because even though I don't need super high amounts of, of fat, but I am in ketosis all the time, my numbers, and I've shared them publicly, I have 50, like I'm, I'm, I'm not a lean mass hyper responder. I'm not in that context. But I do have 140 average LDL, 
40 to 50 trucks. That is a that is a that that would be a lean mass type responder. I have a lean mass, opinion. but very much in the in the low category because if we look at uh, the, the most that are yeah, LDF price, 140 wouldn't qualify based on no, Dave no, but, standards, but but it d depends on the baseline. So so like if your baseline is 60, right, you're gonna you're gonna shoot up to 140. You know, I'm sure if you mainlined carbs carbs for like you know three weeks or whatever and you retook yeah, that ldl lower yeah it would, drop it would be 60 sure. and i'm sure if you go back if you had them you know you'd probably see 60 to 70 something like that for your ldl and now, now that we're speaking about uh, the the lean my cyber responders i mean um i usually talk with a lot of our peers in, in local groups and we have a uh, like small groups where we uh, tackle us different ideas that we've done for years. Like, for example, with Rob Wolf, uh, Ted Neiman, and Marty Kendall, which all of you guys know. And we have talked about these for the last eight years. And you know what we usually do when we have patients like that? Exactly what Nick is now doing. Every time that I have a patient with the lean mass hyper responder, like a triad in a way, just because I'm not a doctor and I don't want to put just patients in risk. And instead of putting them into statins, usually what we do is, you know, let's try adding 50, 80 grams of carbohydrate from good quality sources, not Oreos. Just let's eat more sweet potato or carrots if you want to, et cetera. And yeah, it, that basically lowers your cholesterol and the patient is happy. We are happy. The person keeps still maintaining uh, you know, a good uh, amount of performance. Like everything is, everything both by how they feel and by lab numbers is happy. So that's a, a good way for us to, not get into medical context, which again, I'm, because I'm not a doctor, I won't go into that area, but that keeps the patient happy and their doctor happy. And we yeah. can continue coaching the person well, correctly where we want to. So so this is why we public, you know, people don't realize this, but, uh, you know, I worked with D Dave Feldman and Nick. We published two and a half years ago, three years ago, almost literally this exact thing in the literature so that people could, and it's been cited now like 30 times, um, so that people could could do this, right? Yeah. So we demonstrated that if you collect the LDL beforehand and you demonstrate that the diet sends it up, that in a context, in a clinic context, in a case series of patients that reintroducing carbohydrates to 50 to 100 grams reverses the phenomenon. Now, subsequently, they've gone to do a meta-analysis uh, showing this phenomenon and showing how in randomized uh, diet interventions that compared low fat to low carb, that BMI stratifies the LDL quite quite well. And this is the true for, for intermittent fasting data. So which means that carbohydrates, carbohydrate reintroduction is the mechanism to lower you know, LDL, LDL in a sort of hyper responding state, which is a uniformly the case, right? Is uniformly the case. Like I, I am, well, you know, this is, this is something yeah. that I don't, you know, unless somebody has autoimmune disease or something like that, that's artificially suppressing the LDL, this is 100% uniformly the case. So, and now the, or the Oreo stunt was awesome because it, it brought the context into, you know, hey, you can use a drug or you can use a crappy, nobody in the world. We use sweet potatoes at first, but nobody like, nobody was, you know, everybody said Tro is a carb zealot, you know, after I published it, a low carb zealot. And I'm like, I literally, you're telling patients to take a sweet potato to lower their LDL and I published it for you. And, you know, people are calling me a zealot which I found, you know, really, uh, you know, interesting, but yeah, we call you a zealot for a lot of other reasons, but that's just one that's of them. One of the, yeah, but so the, uh, the, the other, so, but the thing is, is this, this issue with the, the Oreo paper was to highlight that it is the nutrition, you know, whether you want to mainline 50 grams of Oreos or, you know, take 50 grams of, you know, sweet potato, it is the modest carbohydrate reintroduction that reverses this phenomenon in a lean state. Well, and the other thing it does is it provides a, a, a freedom to put people with obesity, right, on a low carb diet, knowing that it will most likely not affect their cholesterol until they get sufficiently lean, which, you know, it gives- Which is like, yeah, who's going to complain about that, right? And and I think you know, on the other side of the spectrum, and I think this is where- 
people have to understand we're looking at that patient in front of us. Not there's not a one size fits all. I think we've made that very clear in the podcast over the last five years or whatever, however, however long we've been doing this. But I had a patient I got consulted on who's a doctor. Her sugars are running 360, 380 every afternoon. Her LDL cholesterol is through the roof. She consults me. I'm like, oh my gosh, she's going to be a disaster. She probably has never exercised. And then she gets on and she's 96 pounds. I'm looking at her going, wait a minute, you're not the same patient. And it turns out she was working out at a high level, doing CrossFit, eating zero carbs. And I was like, okay, let's add carbs back in. I think I even consulted you, Tronco. What do you think? Let's add in carbs. Let's cut down your workout intensity for a week. And her sugars normalized or LDL normalized within two or three weeks, right? It's ridiculous. But you can stress your body so much with a cortisol response where it's a you have a diminishing returns and actually start harming yourself if you get too fanatical, if you're that lean person. But most of us don't have to worry about that for the next five or 10 years, right? Yeah, look, can I, uh, can I, uh, can I tell you, it is, uh, it is amazing. And if you look at, you know, you talked about cortisol and we talked about anorexia and that is, you know, that is actually key because anorexia is one of the other places this phenomenon is seen. Like, Absolutely. And that issue is really anorexic, right? Like really like you're exercising at a high level, not to eating enough calories and your body's freaking out. So yeah, the highest LDL I've ever seen is in an anorexic. Is it because she was eating too much fat? <laughs> of course not. Yeah, but 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 it's tough, you know. Uh, it's tough convincing modern lipidology, and you know, uh, it took a long time even to, you know, get to the people like Ted Naiman and who were sort of somewhere between low carb and and an agnostic approach, right? To have you know have them sort of uh, realize the the, you know, sort of what we see in the clinic. You know uh, what we're seeing, and I don't blame them. You know these guys are evidence-based people looking at the evidence, and that's why we published it, and that's why we continue to publish it. You know, so you guys can go and make empowered decisions. You know, um, you know that are evidence-based. So, Lisa, I, I like to ask you, uh, shifting gears for a minute here. Oh, when you're, <laughs> he's he's busy, Tro man. Dang. Yeah, he's really busy. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's got to be the missus. Oh, no problem. Yeah. If it was the missus, you get a free pass and we'll make fun of you for the rest of your life, but you get a free pass. But uh, um, so a lot of people are going to go, well, if you're keto, you're not cycling. If you're keto all the time, your insulin's low, you can't put on muscle mass. What do you say to that argument? So that, that's very much a, what, what I've met my, let's say, career on or my thesis on. And there are quite a few misunderstandings on, on the topic. So, for example, they tend to think that, for example, you actually need uh, super high insulin to build muscle, right? So the main drivers for muscle building first are the stimulus, which is the strength training. And then you have, uh, or the, you need the building block, which is protein. Just the, the, the um, thing about feeding protein also will elevate insulin to a small extent. That's more than enough. And that's this has actually been studies. One of my favorite studies that reviewed the, the topic is one by Staples in 2011, if I recall correctly, where he actually fed uh, bodybuilders both with whey protein alone and whey protein with dextrose. And what he found is basically the elevation of insulin is exactly the same, both with just the whey, 25 grams of whey before training or around training, give you the same amount of insulin as basically having 30 or 40 grams of dextrose with it. So by adding dextrose is basically just adding sugar for no reason whatsoever. That's yeah, it's going to add calories, but it's not going to increase insulin significantly. That's one thing. The other thing is that in non um, in natural athletes and in uh, normal amounts produced by your body, insulin isn't anabolic. The function of insulin when building muscle is mostly an anti catabolic agent. There's uh, an equation that I can show you guys or send you later where basically shows the process of building muscle. So strength training plus whey protein or protein per se is anabolic that it enhances uh, muscle protein synthesis. The function of insulin is mostly um, helps mitigate muscle protein breakdown. And so the result between muscle protein synthesis minus pro uh, muscle protein breakdown is the net result of whether you're going to be building or not building. Muscle. So basically you don't actually need carbohydrates for the purpose of elevating insulin. You actually don't care about if insulin is elevated or not that much, especially in the context of a low carb diet, as long as you're eating sufficient protein during the day 
And if you want to optimize a little bit the concept, okay, just have a protein shake around training. That's more than enough to elevate slightly your insulin to get that extra benefit that you may want from or to reduce a muscle protein breakdown. That's one thing. And then um, another thing that usually is called upon is without carbs, you're not going to have sufficient energy to train because your body needs glycogen, you know, muscle glycogen and it's what actually moves your, your muscles. That's correct. But they also forget that every time that you exercise, especially in an anaerobic condition, meaning strength training, you produce lactate. What happens with lactate? Lactate is recycled in the liver via the Cori cycle, then it turns into glucose, and that glucose gets shuffled back into your muscles as glycogen again. So basically, it's self-recycled. You recycle lactate into more, glu into more glucose, into more glycogen. This is also why, I don't know if you've heard, uh, at least I've heard it in Latin America, and it's something that very much grinds my gears. Some low-carb doctors have said that you shouldn't train while in ketosis because it kicks you out of ketosis. Have you ever heard that? I mean, it does. It does kick you out of ketosis, but it doesn't yeah, but it matter. Does. You know, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My ketones drop when I work out hard. They, yeah, they well, drop. you can do well, if I'm in ketosis too. Yeah. yeah, you can do yeah, zone two, and and if you wanted to exercise and you know, I mean, the thing here is it's a misunderstanding because it's not a it's not a bug. It's a feature. Of, of exactly on, on ketosis and this exactly why do you get kicked out of ketosis because you are recycling lactate into glucose and when this glucose is in your bloodstream it's going to elevate blood glucose it's going to elevate uh, insulin to get it back into your muscles because it's working as intended and it's going to mildly kick you out of ketosis for the next following 40 minutes or so you're going to go back into ketosis later mm -hmm. after a good workout probably more intensively I've done like several tests on this, like just measured my blood, blood glucose before and after training, ketones before and after, just to show that it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. And it's not that you should avoid strength training because of the high almighty ketone level. No. It's yeah. And you could also, yeah, and people would also are like, it's idiotic also along the same lines is if I do a super intense workout, like if I'm on a fasted bike ride and I'm going up a big hill, my sugars go the highest ever when I do that. When I'm cruising and taking it easy, they drop back down to normal because your body is saying, uh oh, this is a stress situation. You're depleting your glycogen stores in your muscle and you kick it out. This is the whole concept behind what Ben Bikikio is doing. And I think the other the other thing that I'm I, and I think I'm right on this one, Tro, no matter what Ben says, he I, I gave him credit for other stuff. But I think if you have someone with a super high insulin, there's a benefit of being in zone two for a while and like letting that insulin drop down during that exercise. And then doing high intensity interval training. I think you're going to have a better result on that than if you just do high intensity by itself, right? If your insulin is high, if you're an insulin resistant person, it just makes sense by what we're seeing physiologically and what we're seeing on the continuous glucose monitor. Because I know if I work out at a high level, my sugars go higher. And Andrew Kutnick's showing that as a type one diabetic. If he doesn't shoot insulin before a super intense workout, his sugars go way up because he can't turn the brakes off <laughs> of the gluconeogenesis. Yeah. So he shoots a little bit of insulin before his workout. If he doesn't, and he does it at the end, he has to use three times more insulin to shut down that glucagon response. You know what, what we've done with a lot of clients, and this is why we have also part of the protocol, having the whey shake before training. We, we call this a keto gains pre-workout shake or coffee. It's basically coffee with MCT and 25 grams of, of whey protein. And because a lot of our clients are diabetic, pre-diabetic, or even type one, basically this helps mitigate the sugar uh, roller coaster. And you're getting the protein around training also to meet what we were saying, have that little spike of insulin, but it's a controlled spike. And having it with the MCT lowers a little bit or mitigates uh, the release, but also gives them re readily available energy in the form of the MCT. So. It's a trick that we've used over the, the span of the last uh, eight to 10 years. And it works especially well with diabetic clients that tend to have these uh, like a spike and roller coaster and not feel very well when training. Luis, what would you say your favorite protein source is for the diabetic, pre-diabetic, you know, accountant that's trying to get in shape and work out? What's your advice as far as nutrition? You're talking about eggs or, or uh, tuna. What, what's your, your protein of choice other than the, the protein shakes, whey protein? So uh, believe it or not, I'm not a big fan of protein shakes. Like I, again, people think bodybuilder, they live on protein shakes. I'm only, I only suggest protein shake one per day in the case that you are strength training. If you're not going to train, get the food from uh, like Whole Foods. Mm. And my favorite 
uh, suggestion is usually red meat. Why, going back, uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm also gonna send you this study from, uh, I think it's the Nutrients um, Journal, but they have, it's from uh, 2022, I think, where basically they uh, highlight the most nutrient dense foods on the planet, right? And if you go back to a bodybuilding perspective, it's always broccoli and chicken or tuna and broccoli, right? Those are great protein sources, but are the void of nutrients. And my big, uh, like my big take in the last uh, five years, where I've changed a lot of my practices, nutrient dense foods. And the most nutrient dense foods is going to be red meats, uh, some eggs, of course, a little bit of dairy, and green vegetables. If you, and of course, uh, fish from cold water, right? The salmon, mm -hmm. uh, cod, things like that. Um, if you gravitate and you would only have the choice of eating one source of protein, for me would be red meat. Again, because high in iron, high, high in vitamin B, uh, many other nutrients, whereas chicken is great, but it's the void of all of these nutrients as well. And another thing, because I'm a big pursuer of satiety, and I know that it's all in the rage of satiety recently, and I'm very happy for this, how it's been gravitating, but in my personal experience, and I don't know if you've done some research on this, and I would love to hear more people talk about this, certain types of protein are faster digested than others. And it's not just because, uh, because of the fat that comes within, it's because of the cellular walls. And this is something that I found more so in a veterinary study rather than in um, a study for humans or, or for cattle. What I found is that, for example, have you ever wondered yourself why it's uh, when you eat, for example, chicken or white fish, you can be hungry a few hours later versus if you eat meat or from red meat? I'm immediately so, hungry. It's it's uh, almost ubiquitous. This, uh, you know, um, I suspected it was due to the protein source and the saturated fat. It's not really for because of the fat, because even if you eat ground beef, like 90 percent, the satiety is going to be much greater on the beef. So what I found, and I may be wrong, it's because of the cellular walls of what the, like the, the collagen and what the protein is made of. So fish protein on general is going to be a little bit faster digesting as well as chicken, like the type of protein and the collagen walls and, and it, which is actually called a fiber as well. So if, if someone asks you like, there's only fiber in vegetables, technically yes, but also the collagen from animal sources of also considered a fiber biologically in certain mm -hmm. uh, contexts and they also have the benefits of fiber for digestion and butyrate and many other beneficial things but the topic is the collagen and the fibers from muscle meat from especially mammal meat is it takes a little bit more to break down and does that affects a little bit of the satiety versus eating tilapia white fish overall and of course fat does play a part of course, the fattier fish or the fattier cuts of meat also will affect transit time, right? That's that's a known fact. I've but, I've seen some data also to suggest. Sorry to interject. Also, yeah. the saturated fat uh, does release more GLP, which could also delay gastric emptying. Then you know uh, you know the, the higher the omega three content and the higher the saturated fat content, the more GLP is released. Right. Um, so, so I wonder if, you know, it's a combination of all these factors. You know? I don't think there, there's like, a, like you, you were saying at the beginning, uh, Brian, everybody has a little bit of information. It's like when you're touching an elephant, right? One touches the, the, the legs, the other the trunk, the other the tail, and everybody has a little bit of perspective, but we, we aren't really seeing the whole picture. And I do think there's a little bit of everything in here because I've seen a lot of people in, in, in the high fat camp of keto, right? It's not... I, I'm hungry, eat more fat, eat more fat. Where I come from, from uh, trying to get people leaner and fitter to a point, not just uh, lose weight overall. I'm more pushing protein and, and nutrients rather than just fat per se. I think there's a big component where all of those are intertwined, which take us back to eating whole foods is the key because naturally whole foods have all of those things in common. High, whole foods are nutrient dense, have the fat naturally that comes with them in, in a perfect ratio, have the amount of protein that we need. And the moment that we start to play 
and transform all of these things is when, even if macro-wise, they look good on paper, even if caloric-wise, they look amazing on paper, we cannot really outsmart nature. And that's when all of these things start to happen metabolically with diseases, our uncontrolled hunger, and everything that we are seeing nowadays, right? Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot to this. Society. Look, check this guy out, guys. I just want to share this real quick with you because it's so crazy. It's such a dumb thing. I, I I did a terrible experiment last night. So this, have you guys ever heard of konjac root or uh, glucomannan? Oh, jeez. I hate so, it. I, but but check it out. I, I I go. Let me just test this out. So I did a forty eight hour fast right here. These spikes up here. In the early morning was for my workout, doing spin class, workout in the morning, and then during the there's not the end of a forty eight hour fast. So I go. You know what? I'm gonna see what this konjac root does. A stupid thing. So I take it with an eight ounce of water, and I my friends go. Hey, you want to get Chinese? I haven't eaten Chinese food in three years, five years. I go. Okay, I'll, I go out for Chinese food, and everyone knows Chinese food is a total disaster for for uh, for okay. insulin spikes. Right? It's a disaster. So I go. Okay, and I had a little bit or barely just to see what would happen. So look at what my sugars did when I ate. This could be because my body said, okay, gluconeogenesis, let's shut it off. But it dropped from like 106 before eating after fasting for 48 hours. And then it dropped down to like 81, 80s. And then look what it did like three or four hours. It, it, it totally came up. So I think what it had to do is release that sh that sh carb release slower because it waited. It was like three or four hours after I ate the stuff that I it, I never get a sugar response at night like that. And I was like, it has to have slowed down the And so you go, okay, is there a benefit to that? If you're eating a small amount of carbohydrates, maybe, you know, if you're slowing, you don't get that huge insulin response. So I think in my diabetics, I'm seeing some improvements on sugar control. If they try it like before their biggest meal of the day, maybe. Yeah, totally. Maybe oh, GLP one's going. I mean, uh, you know, Robert Lustig. There's a great podcast he did, and that's what made me think about this, because we know if you know if one of your guys eats a steak and then he has some bananas after the the steak, it's not going to have as big of an insulin response as it would have by that banana by itself at ten in the morning, right? We know it's the order of what we're eating too makes a difference in this glucose response, and by by extrapolation we shouldn't be seeing as big of an insulin response. So if we're trying to keep those insulin levels as low as possible, maybe for some people that's going to be beneficial. It doesn't give you a license to go eat crappy food all the time, but you go, okay, if I can slow that down a little bit, maybe there's a benefit to the fiber, increasing GLP-1 levels, slowing the gastric release, and you go, okay, is there some benefit to that? I think there may be some benefit. As, as always, not having con constant bout bouts of high insulin all the time, I think it's going to be beneficial for vastly the majority of population, especially if overweight, right? I don't think mild spikes are negative depending on the context. Like, mm -hmm. for example, you're going to be strength training or doing, uh, like, I don't know, an, uh, something important regarding exercise. A mild spike works. Who cares? Yeah, it's because you're lowering exactly. the insulin down, too, and you get this glucose. Why would you want to have high insulin? Um, yeah. So I think those are the big things. Toro has to take off. He's got patients to take care of. But hey, thanks so much for everything. Ed, do you have any other big points you want to share for our audience? Like things you go, okay, guys, you're struggling. You're trying to get things figured out. You're plateaued out. What are some kind of good things? And also, I, before we leave, I, I, what's your opinion on creatine since this is in your area too? Do you think it helps with yeah. metabolic health? Do you think it helps with fat oxidation? So first uh, on creatine, I'm just going to say that I have my parents, both my parents on creatine and they are over 70 years old. Why? Because people just tend to think that creatine is just for bodybuilders and muscle building. And uh, creatine, basically what it does is recycle ATP. So it's not just for muscle building, it's more for overall energy during the day, but it also unknown or recently found as nootropic, meaning that it also fits your brain. And if you're doing a low carb diet, it has even more benefits because on the low carb diet, it's very easy to be dehydrated and to have lower uh, fluids overall. And because creatine, what it does is rehydrate your muscles in a way, it stores, it gets stored inside the muscles. That's why you have the meat that it uh, makes you gain weight per se. Mm -hmm. What creatine does is in a way, it, it, it is retained inside your muscles. So you may gain one or two pounds depending of extra water weight, but it's not going to make you look bloated. It's actually going to make your muscles look a little bit more fuller, which is more beneficial on a ketogenic diet versus, or it's gonna, you're gonna get better results on keto versus in a traditional high carb diet, just by adding creatine. And uh, again, 
it's very important for brain function. There are a lot of benefits uh, regarding that area. Yeah, That's Ben Bigman just posted something with, with patients with dementia doing better with creatine supplementation, yeah, of course. Exactly. And, and for that, uh, usually what I suggest is five grams if you just want the strength building properties. For, for overall mental health, the benefits tend to start at 10 to 12 grams or a little bit more. And just a little bit of adverse. So a higher effect. dose for the mental part of it than muscle building. Yeah. Yeah, wow, exactly. that's amazing. That's news to me. Yeah, and the thing is that um, for creatine to work, you have to super compensate it, which means that uh, if you eat lots of meat, for example, or as someone like eats carnivore, there's a myth that you're going to get enough creatine from your food. And the thing is that you really don't. Why? Because uh, probably two grams, for, sorry, two pounds of uh, raw meat, of beef, probably do has five grams of creatine. But m most people are not going to be eating that amount of just pure meat every day and even less raw, right? The moment that you start to hit meat, it actually degrades. So the creatine, basically, you get probably, you lose about 40 to 60% of it when you wow. eat it. Okay. So you only get it one or two, two uh, grams per day if you only eat red meat. And again, you would have to eat, sorry, it's about a kilogram of, uh, of uh, red meat. So nobody eats a, a kilo, unless you're probably- uh, Sean Sean. Baker. Yeah, probably. I don't think yeah. most people will eat. And, and then also it's expensive. It's much cheaper to just get creatine in powder. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. And then you have to get it every day because, again, it's super compensation. So basically what you have in your muscles, whether you use it or not, it degrades naturally. What you eat, whether you use So it doing creatine not, even on non-exercise days? I've been always. doing creatine for the last 20 years. I think as almost as long as I've been on keto, I've been- wow using creatine just like every day upon awaking i have it with my coffee that's it i'd be curious from your standpoint of trying to put on muscle mass what's your opinion of intermittent fasting time restricted eating and you know doing a two or three day fast like do you think that's detrimental to what you're trying to accomplish from a metabolic standpoint yeah no, like i think two or three day fast are good if you have a metabolic issue and you want to maybe do a you know the, the cell cleaning and then the increase autophagy especially if you do it in a controlled fashion that i think that's a good, a good thing that especially most people should try at least once in their lifetime also to try themselves and test resilience from a bodybuilding perspective. The, and especially if you look at the new, new recent study that very much goes in line with my, my line of thinking and what I've studied, total amount of protein during the day is more important uh, than the actual timing of it. Okay. So if you if you aim for your ideal amount of protein, it doesn't matter if you fast. Now, if you want to optimize, and this is something that I practice and I try to teach my clients, is try to sandwich your training around your feeding window or have it close, because there is a benefit from both the anabolic signal from strength training, which I mentioned before, like the two factors. Uh -huh. You need strength training to create muscle protein synthesis and then aligning that with the building block, which is protein. So it's very much or how I explain it is imagine that you're building a house, which is building your muscles, right? Then you hire the masons or the workers to do the work, but then you don't supply the building blocks. Like, oh, yeah, you guys, uh, you're going to start to work yeah. at 12, but the cement and the bricks come at <laughs> yeah. 3 p.m. So just do, you know, stay there standing. You're going to waste their yeah. payroll probably two or three hours. That's what can happen. And there are some studies that do support that the anabolic window isn't as small as some people think, but there's a thing called protein syncing where you can sync or synchronize that anabolic response from the training with having the, the available amino acids around training. Because uh, also another thing that a lot of people don't know, do you know how much of the amount of protein that you actually eat is going to be distributed or used towards muscle building? Well, I don't know if necessarily towards muscle building, but you know, they talked about this on Huberman that 30% of it is used in just breaking it down into its constituent parts and rebuilding it so that calorically it's about you know 30% less than if you ate gummy bears, right? Um, yeah. As far as the calorie intake into your body that you're actually is usable, but I don't know how much is actually, it's, I would say it's a high percentage that's used for muscle mass versus it's not a good energy source. So th there are two concepts here that uh, I think we're mixing. One thing, what you mentioned is called a thermic effect of protein. Exactly. So what happens is, okay, let's say that by numbers, four, uh, one gram of protein has four calories. 
in reality, it's about 1.3 because just the process of digestion, mm -hmm. you lose about 30% as long as this protein comes from whole sources. Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen if you have it, for example, one protein shake. It's going to have a very small uh, effect of uh, a thermic effect. It doesn't work. This is also why I don't recommend protein shakes. You're not going to get those free calories in a way, right? But the amino acids that you get from protein are going to stay intact. So that doesn't affect it. But in reality, because protein is not only used for muscle building, protein is used for building your bones, building your enzymes, creating hormones, and just recovering overall from your overall current structure and your organs, just about 5% of the actual protein that you eat is going to be used towards muscle building. Wow. If the conditional, if what you already need first is already uh, sufficient. So the, that's why the basic recommendation. So if you're if you're lacking muscle, you're going to use more for muscle building. To a point, yes. But if but first, you ha you are going to be feeding your organs, your natural immune function, etc. This is why if you're constantly no transmitters, all that kind of stuff that re exactly. require amino acids. Exactly. So this is also why for me, protein is the most important macro rather than fat on a ketogenic diet because people chronically under eat protein. So. What I normally suggest is 1.2 grams of protein per lean pound you weight. Or it can be translated, or in, a, in another way, is like optimally, like the, if you were to say what, what is the most amount of protein that I would need to eat to, for optimal muscle building, okay, your height in centimeters in protein grams. That would Not be great. Like yeah, your your like a very easy to understand number without actually having to uh, account for your lean mass or whatever. Because even if you weigh two hundred pounds and you have thirty percent body fat, you don't need two hundred pounds of of protein. But depending, of course, what your lean mass is. Most males, what I found is, most females need in between one hundred and twenty up to one hundred and fifty. Most males need around one hundred and fifty to two hundred uh, grams of protein per day. Depending, of course, their size. Yeah, and that and that's what we run into from our standpoint because uh, a lot of people are OMADs and they go, "That's a lot of protein to eat at one time." So, so splitting it up is going to make it easier for a middle-aged female who's menopausal, exactly. right? It's going to be hard to get that much protein. You're going to be miserable trying to get that in. And like you said, they look at you, go, "I can't eat that much." Instead of going, "I got a calorie restrict," they're like, "Oh my gosh, how much do I have to eat? Like, how am I going to do that?" Like it's a, like they're eating an elephant, right? It's really amazing. But it's not really that hard if you. Played right. I normally I, I fast for about sixteen to twenty hours, depending. Let's say eighteen on average. What I have is three to four eggs in the morning with maybe four hundred grams of ground beef, and then maybe another four hundred or three hundred grams of ground beef with vegetables. That takes me to two hundred grams of protein per day, which is my normal goal, and that's very easy to do, and I don't have to even think about it. And yeah, it's just what you do. You don't have to count. You have to. You know what you do. You know what works for you, and there you go. It's easy, right? Exactly. It's so yeah. awesome. And that works very well for a lot of uh, dudes as well. For females, like you were saying, they tend to be a little bit on the smaller side, so two or three meals usually work better for them. Awesome. Hey, man, thanks for everything. I mean, it, 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 you know, everything you're saying, if I, that's it matches up with what we're seeing clinically. And it's so amazing that we can have it from different perspective. Cause I've always made the argument, look, we're seeing really sick, metabolically sick people. You know, the bodybuilder guys are seeing the metabolically healthy people. They can get away with way more carbs or they're like, they're doing that. And this is another argument why exercise is so critically important. And when I first came onto the low carb scene, everyone said, you don't have to exercise. It's just about diet. It's like, well, there's a massive, you know, diet does, I mean, exercise does so many things for longevity, muscle mass, mood, energy, you know, binge eating disorder, all these things when you when you even everything out by having muscle mass and exercise, the the mental benefits and the anxiety relieving benefit. There's so much. So that's why it's so important that we all team up and go, okay, go fix them on the exercise part, go fix them on the diet side and, and whatever we can do to get people healthier and you know, keep them out of nursing homes and like we've been saying, muscle mass is the biggest indicator. So, hey, how do how do people track you down if they want to find you, if they want to get you to help them with, you know, their their you know, metabolic health journey and all that kind of stuff. For sure. So basically everything that you see on the web, uh, keto gains, Twitter, Reddit, uh, Instagram is, uh, related to me, or you can look Luis, uh, underscore Bill Asenor. That's me as well. And I also have a, an electrolyte company, which, uh, probably, you know, which is called uh, drink element or element electrolytes. 
uh, which we also develop to help people with uh, that are doing a low carb uh, lifestyle or fasting or uh, carnivore or very much any diet in general. Uh, so any any of those channels, basically, you can hit me up and I'll be there answering questions. Yeah, awesome. And, and I'll tell you, you know, uh, Element, I use it a lot of my practice. We're not sponsored by them. We have no, no, I have no financial interest in them, but great results with myself too. When I'm doing fasting, I'll, I'll throw that in. My patients, it really helps them because electrolyte deficiencies, a lot of people, especially athletes. So it's a great product and it's really helped a lot of my patients. So we have samples here that we give out to our patients. Go, here you go, here you go, take this, try this. And it's really helped people with satiety and help them with, with regard to one of the things that people don't know or, or don't talk about is when your insulin starts dropping, a lot of times people start craving sugar because insulin makes you hold in the salt in your kidneys, right? So you eat sugar and you raise up and you, res so if you're eating salt, people will just put salt on the back of their hand, lick it and they go, oh, my cravings went away. And it's really because you're getting that salt craving, not a sugar craving, but we confuse that in our brain, you know? So yeah, I've had really good results with Element. I know Tro's used it and I have a lot of athletes on it that's really helped their performance. So thanks for that. That's awesome stuff. And keep doing what you're doing, man. Thanks for, for uh, you know, for really, I mean, you, you really, open that door. Cause I it's, there's so many people who go, you can't put on muscle mass on a ketogenic diet. I'm going to go, oh, I, I have someone who's going to argue with you on that. Right. So it's really important that people don't think they have to carb load before every exercise session. And you got to eat, drink Gatorade when you exercise for 10 minutes, it just doesn't make any sense. So thanks for that. And, and, uh, for all you're doing and, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Brian, for the invite. It was uh, very nice talking to you both. And I also learned a lot of you from, from you guys. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you.